Hello and welcome back for part four of the digestive system. Uh, in this video we will be looking at the large intestines and the anatomy and function of the large intestines um, as well as kind of going through and, and pointing out and indicating some review tables that will be located at the end of uh, the PowerPoint that you have access to um, and uh, you also have access to some videos um, to help you review uh, the digestive system as well. And so uh, let's go ahead and get started and uh, look at some of the anatomy that we need to consider. And so uh, let me draw your attention right here. This here is the ileum. Uh, this is where the small intestines is going to end. And then this area right here, uh, that is the ileocecal valve or the ileocecal sphincter. And what will happen is anything that has not been um, absorbed through the small intestines uh, is going to be basically leftover material. And that gets deposited here uh, within the cecum. Right now, I've got this little dangly thing right here. Uh, this here is the appendix. Right. The appendix uh, stores bacterial reserve uh, and that way you can go ahead and repopulate the various flora that is found here within the large intestines. And so uh, the appendix does definitely serve a purpose. Um, much of feces development uh, is predicated on the ability uh, for bacteria to conduct decomposition, to go in and break down uh, whatever nutrients may still be uh, within the remaining material and uh, helping to create uh, the final waste product, which would be feces. Um, and so all of that remaining material is emptied in here into the cecum right here. All right. uh, and then we come up into the ascending colon followed by the transverse colon followed by the descending colon here is the sigmoid colon which then turns into the rectum and then this lower area right here where um, the rectum comes down and then kind of constricts right about here uh, this here is the anal canal uh, and, of course, the uh, muscular sphincters, the external and internal anal canal located right here. You'll also notice up here uh, the ascending colon. At the point when it turns into the transverse colon, we call that pivot or that turn the right colic flexure. And likewise, where the transverse colon ends and turns into the de descending colon, we have the left colic flexure located right here. Uh, you will also notice that uh, located in the center of our colon or large intestine, this space right here, uh, is a mesentery. And that mesentery, much like um, the mesentery that's found within the small intestines, this mesentery is equally as vascularized. Uh, and so this, we are delivering blood uh, to the colon. But more importantly, we're able to go ahead and uh, reabsorb any final last bits of uh, either nutrients or mainly water. Uh, from the matter that's been left to the colon before it officially becomes feces. Um, what is stimulating the colon uh, is directly related to what is happening here within the stomach. And so if we were to kind of back up here um, to uh, a quite a few slides back, and look at the stomach. Uh, the stomach has stretch receptors. 
And as the stomach stretches, those stretch receptors uh, will then go ahead and stimulate uh, autonomic nerves from the stomach down to both the small intestines and the large intestines. Um, the autonomic stimulation, the sympathetic stimulation within the small intestines is preparing the small intestines for the delivery of chyme from the stomach. But here in the large intestines, that sympathetic stimulation uh, is basically as food, as food bolus is entering into the stomach, the stomach stretches due to the stomach filling, it will stimulate peristalsis to begin to occur throughout the large intestines. And so what will happen is um, you've just inputted more into the GI tract, and so uh, you have to force out what is already in the GI tract, right? Uh, and so uh, if you don't do that, you get backed up. Right? And so if you're going to fill one end of the GI tract, you have to empty the other end of the GI tract to prepare for more um, materials to be delivered. Right? And so know that what is stimulating the production of feces, what is stimulating the holstra to begin this contractional motion is actually stretch receptors that are stimulating sympathetic neurons from the stomach down to uh, down to the colon. Um, opioids, ironically, will uh, deaden or numb those sympathetic uh, neurons and therefore you do not get a stimulation within the colon and that ultimately leads to constipation. Right? So you're eating, you're delivering stuff, you're delivering chyme into the small intestines, the small intestines is removing nutrients, that stuff is now being all pushed into the colon and the colon is numb to any neural stimulation coming from the stomach. And so that material sits and sits and sits and the individual becomes constipated and more constipated. And, and we'll talk about why that is here coming, in a, coming up in a, in a few minutes. Um, real quick, we will kind of point out to you, right, again, this here are the glands and the cells that are found within the colon. Right? So notice that our main cells, we have absorptive cells here and we have goblet cells. Um, goblet cells, again, is still producing mucus for us. The absorptive cells that you're seeing located here um, are pretty much absorbing water out of the materials that have been deposited into the colon. And so uh, we're going to find out that, the, and as we talked about in the beginning of the PowerPoint of, the, of the, our look at the digestive system, and as we'll talk about again, uh, there's one final push to conserve as much water as we can out of what we have already excreted and released. Um, again, notice that we have these uh, intestinal glands that are all located in here. Again, those intestinal glands are largely made up of the absorptive cells and the goblet cells. A larger look at what we're dealing with Right. This should be all familiar to you from what we've looked at in lab. Right. The mucosal layer we know uh, is made up of the epithelial tissue as well as the lamina propia, right, which you can see identified over here. Right. The lamina propia that's located right over here. Right. Um, and also uh, the uh, muscularis layer of the mucosa. And then you've got your submucosal layer. And then you have your muscularis. So remember that the muscularis uh, is made up of the uh, circular muscle right, right here. Um, and really that longitudinal muscle is a specialized uh, 
muscle that becomes the tenia coli. <clears throat> now, functionally, functionally, um, what is f moving feces through the colon are the hostra, right? Uh, and so the hostra. Uh, is what is that those accordion like structures that we see lining the colon right? so uh, right here would be a holstra this here is a holstra this here is a holstra right? so you've got those holstra that are uh, throughout the large intestines lining all avenues all segments of the colon right? and then you've got this band of smooth muscle that's helping the holstra contract. And this band of smooth muscle that you see right here is the tenia coli. All right. And the combination between um, the smooth muscle contracting within the tenia coli and the accordion-like movement of contraction and relaxation within the holstra creates peristalsis. Right. And as we move this feces down the colon, uh, we refer to this as mass peristalsis. And the whole point of this is to drive the feces down through the colon, get it down into the rectum for expulsion. Um, and keep in mind uh, that what is driving um, feces formation, what is driving decomposition of the remaining material is bacteria. Right. And bacteria uh, is converting proteins into amino acids. Uh, if there is any kind of carbohydrate that might be left in there, it's going to convert that into glucose. Um, it's going to be breaking down um, the amino acids to be able to kind of to be able to uh, to uh, create various vitamins, vitamin B, vitamin K. Um, some hormones are actually produced by these bacteria, things like serotonin. Um, even some testosterone is actually produced by bacteria within the colon. And so we have this symbiotic relationship with bacteria that's living within our colon and our own stability and function as an independent organism. Um, there's approximately 800 uh, if not more than 800 different species of bacteria that reside within the colon. Uh, one of those is E. coli. E. coli is part of our natural uh, flora of bacterial diversity. Uh, and we've talked about this before uh, with uh, when you consume dairy products and you cannot break down lac Toast, which is a dairy sugar, because you're no longer producing the enzyme lactase, that lactose is actually conserved within the GI tract until it gets to the colon, in which E. coli will go ahead and drive the decomposition of lactose. <clears throat> and when it does that, um, it creates gas, it creates lactic acid fermentation, basically. Um, and uh, causes the bloating and the cramping that is synonymous with being lactose intolerant. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is of the material that is reaching of the material that is reaching uh, the large intestines, 75% of what is being received by the colon is water. 25% of what is being received by the colon is solid waste. All right, now, there's not a whole lot that's actually reaching the colon as far as the water goes. Remember, uh, we started this journey with 9.3 liters of fluid either being ingested or produced by the body, the small intestines 
uh, is absorbing approximately 8 liters right, of that fluid back in uh, and the large intestines is 0 0.9 liters of that uh, and so very little and actually this is 8.3 um, 8.3 liters if I'm going to be specific uh, is absorbed within the small intestines and the large intestines is about 0 0.9 liters um, so uh, there's only about a liter of water that's making it to the large intestines all right uh, so 75% of all of the material that's going into the colon is water. Remember that water is only equaling about a liter of water uh, and then the other 25 percent is solid material and that solid material can be broken down right, that third that 25 percent is actually about 30 percent bacteria. Uh, it's about 30 percent undigested fiber and this is where your corn comes in kind of goes in and comes out looking the same uh, about 15 percent fat all right um, the remaining uh, percentage here right the remaining 20 percent or so of that solid waste um, is mucus it's proteins uh, it's epithelia that has been sloughed off throughout the process um, also you may be curious to know that, maybe not, but it's never stopped me before from sharing things that you don't want to know. Uh, we swallow uh, approximately uh, 7 to 10 liters of gas per day. All right, so um, just through eating and breathing and talking, uh, we are um, introducing or creating 7 to 10 liters of gas per day. Per day. Right. Um, of that, we are absorbing a vast majority of the gas. Right. What I mean by that is we only expel approximately 500 um, milliliters per day of gas. Now, some of us have a much higher ratio of gas expulsion. Uh, some of us are far under that, but everybody expels gas, even females that deny that they engage in such behavior. All right. um, and so the majority of that gas that we are actually introducing is swallowed um, as we eat and all that kind of good stuff. But we're also creating gas. We're creating gas through our little visitors um, and our visitors being uh, the bacteria. Now, uh, the remaining information um, kind of has to do with uh, how do we use all of this stuff that is now being absorbed, right, that we've now taken in. Well, we need the nutrients that have been absorbed to create things like uh, amino acids. Now remember that we have, um, on any given day, uh, going back to protein synthesis, right, we know that amino acid-wise there are 20 um, to 21 amino acids that we need for protein production. Um, I put that in asterisks because of ISO leucine uh, which is an isomer of leucine which is an amino acid right, so you can see isoleucine 
uh, right down here. I forgot the E. Thought that looked odd. Right there. Um, of those 20 to 21 amino acids, nine of them we must obtain through our diet. Right. We just have to. Right. And the nine that we must obtain through our diet are what you see listed right there. Right. These are the nine what we call essential amino acids right, that are only acquired through diet. And so we go ahead and uh, we're using all of these various um, nutrients, specifically glucose, to go ahead and drive cellular respiration. Right? The end goal for everything that we do is cell respiration. Right? This, is, this is our reason for living, being able to create ATP. Um, proteins can be used to run cell respiration. All right. uh, carbohydrates, we know, can be used to run cell respiration. All right. Fats can be used to run cell respiration. So carbohydrates and lipids specifically can be used to run glucose. All right. Triglycerides or fats can also be used to stimulate the process of the Krebs cycle um, in the production of acetyl coenzyme A. Amino acids can help to facilitate glycolysis, Krebs cycle, um, and the Krebs cycle, as well as the production of acetyl coenzyme A. Right, now, this, this should be a review from AMP1 for you, hopefully. Um, again, the end result being, the end result being the production of um, 38 ATP molecules. Right? That is the end result. Um, now remember that during glycolysis we are using substrate level phosphorylation. And in the um, uh, electron transport chain, we are using oxidative phosphorylation. In other words, we're creating a proton gradient. Proton gradient is what powers ATP synthase. Uh, and that way we are creating a higher yield of ATP. Um, this here is just simply a review of glycolysis. This is a review of the Krebs cycle. And this is the review of the electron transport chain, specifically focused on ATP synthase. So if you don't recognize that as being ATP synthase, you want to make sure that you know that this here is ATP. synthase, which uses a proton concentration gradient right, to go ahead and conduct um, oxidative phosphorylation. We're using these hydrogen protons to force that inorganic phosphate onto ADP to create ATP. Um, please be aware of these terminologies. All right? So glycolysis is the process of producing, of converting glucose into pyruvic acid. All right? That is something, again, that is a review, but there are some new terms up there. Right? Glycogenesis um, is the uh, joining or linking of glucose to be able to form more complex molecules, such as glycogen. Uh, this, way that we, uh, this way we don't waste the glucose. We want to absorb as much as that glucose as we can so that we're not wasting it because we can use that glucose to initiate cell respiration. Um, glycogenolysis is the 
breaking apart of glycogen. So it's the removal of those glucose molecules right, from glycogen. Uh, and then glyconeogenesis uh, um, is basically the creation of glucose from non-carbohydrate biomolecules, such as, such as proteins or triglycerides. All right. And that is possible. This, oops, sorry. This process, um, and I may get a little passionate on this. I'm going to apologize now. Um, this process right here of glyconeogenesis is the foundation of the keto diet. And the keto diet is T R A S H. Um, it's trash. It's garbage. It's it's actually harmful, and, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, again, for your lipids, you can see uh, lipolysis, lipogenesis, uh, trans -amina, uh, amina aminination for your proteins, and oxidative deamination um, for your proteins. You can you can take a look at that uh, a little bit more on your own. All right. Um, this is an interesting slide right here because this slide kind of shows us how all of this gets tied together. Right? So uh, when we absorb when we absorb these nutrients from within the GI tract, within the small intestines, right? Um, we're using all of these materials for various things. So the glucose is going to be stored as glycogen within muscle and the liver. We're going to use glucose to run cellular respiration. Uh, we're going to take some of that glucose and turn it into triglycerides, which then gets stored as fat. We're also going to be absorbing those lipids. We're going to be storing it as fat. Um, so you can see here, glucose can become fat. We can also take that glucose and we can turn it into... Um, fatty acids, which are then stored within the liver, which can then be created to turned into triglycerides once again. Uh, we're absorbing amino acids, which can we can then convert into muscular tissue. Um, and we can also use those amino acids to create proteins that are stored within the liver. All right. Um, so that's what you're seeing over here all right, on this side. Uh, you're looking at um, what are we using the triglycerides for? What are we using the proteins for? Right? How do we take protein and lipids and create glucose right. um, to support cell respiration and neural and brain function? Here's here, here's the challenge that I have in this. What's driving all of this on either side of the screen? What is driving this is metabolism. All right? And metabolism by its very nature is going to produce CO2. Right. It's going to produce things like uh, lactic acid, right. um, and both CO2 and lactic acid can lead to something that is referred to as metabolic acidosis. Right. Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is directly related to um, the breakdown of proteins and lipids. Decomposition. Right. What does that mean? Well, what that means is we're taking, we're, we're starving the body of glucose and we're then 
forcing the body to use proteins and lipids to go ahead and create the glucose since we are starving the body of it. And essentially, we're sending the body into starvation. Right? We're sending the body into starvation. Um, and when we do that, when we do that, we create an acidic environment within the body, which impairs neural function. Right? We're decreasing respiration rates very often. We're we're, we're, we're desensitizing the autonomic nervous system. In other words, we're blocking sympathetic neural response. Um, and we're creating an environment of acidosis through metabolism by starving the body of sugar and pumping the body full of proteins and lipids, forcing the body to convert that into glucose. That, this very concept is the basis of the keto diet. You are throwing your body into metabolic acidosis, damaging neural response for the sake of creating glucose that you are starving the body of. That is never a good thing. Never. I'll repeat it again. Never, ever, 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 never, never, ever, ever, never a good thing. And that's why fad diets such as keto diet and South Beach diets and any of the other fad diets out there don't work. Because you are throwing your body out of my favorite anatomically, physiologically related word. Anybody want to guess what it is? Shout it out so that your neighbors can hear it. Um, we're, we're, we're forcing the body to go out of homeostasis. We're sending it into a state of disease. That doesn't make any sense. But people spend thousands of dollars every year creating a state of disease in their body thinking that they're actually healthy. Um, okay, enough of that. Um, metabolic acidosis, the opposite of that is metabolic alkalosis. And this is where you have an increase in bicarbonate ions due to a loss of carbon dioxide. In other words, um, through your metabolic Re, uh, response, you're creating an alkaline environment within the body. Um, what does this? And by the way, you can create that by either removing, um, you decrease CO2 or you decrease um, hydrogen ions, all right? And you increase your bicarbonate ions. Um, vomiting, diuretics, um, nasogastric suctioning. All of those things create metabolic alkalosis. Pay attention to this. Watch this. Because this is key. If you increase 7.4 uh, is your average pH, that's considered normal. Right? If you increase that pH to 7.55, you have, watch this, you have a 40% mortality rate. You have a 40% death rate when you increase the pH of the body within the blood to a 7.55, all right? Increase that to 7.65, and that 40% mor mortality rate goes to 80% mortality rate. Point 
0.1 change in pH doubles your chance of dying. Metabolic alkalosis is just as dangerous as metabolic acidosis. It is just as deadly. Um, fortunately, we typically only see metabolic alkalosis um, in hospital patients. Um, the way we get into a scenario of metabolic alkalosis is uh, hyperventilating. You're basically your respiration rates are increasing so high you're expelling carbon dioxide at an increased rate and that drops the level of carbon dioxide and elevates the the amount of bicarbonate that is uh, found within the body um, and that increases the pH into an alkaline range right. okay so um, the slides that follow are a lot of summary slides. All right, so here's a table of key vitamins and their functions and what they do. All right, here goes some fat soluble vitamins for you to pay attention to. This is a really good summary table of um, uh, hormonal control and what the hormones do. All right, I would pay attention to this. I would know this. All right. um, and there's other slides that are up and available for you as well and this this brings us to the end of the digestive system um, please continue reviewing make sure you're asking questions uh, i am available for you to um, explain things that you might need to have explained a little bit more uh, and so uh, with that said um, i'll catch you on the other side and happy studying